specializes in providing extensive experience in a broad range of homeland security and government uh, relations issues. Through strong relationships with key decision makers inside the Department of Homeland Security and with lawmakers and their senior staff. Senator Balboni is able to get the right person for the right meeting clients, both domestic and international. Mike Balboni, for those of you who don't know it, uh, has been a leader in New York State uh, New York State's Department of Homeland Security as well. We're very proud to have him with us once again here on IGTV as well as at our Security Summit. Uh, everybody, please welcome uh, Mike Balboni. I'm at a conference. You know, I get I'm a chance a to travel to, to, to a lot of different uh, sectors, yeah. sectors of the government, and so I've heard a lot of different presentations. Sorry. In fact, last week I was just at Long Island, where the FBI SACs were talking about different operation techniques and tempos and strategies that they were going to present to their agents. And what I've done is, is kind of taken a 10,000 foot view of this. You know, oftentimes when you're in the field, when you actually have cases that you're working, if you are actually trying to provide infrastructure protection, you're in the weeds. You get those endless streams of emails and information about attacks that have happened here, attacks that have happened there. And it's very difficult, I know I find it very difficult to figure out what does it all mean, particularly almost 11 years after the seminal event in our history of 9-11. And so what I've done this morning is, is kind of prepared a, a presentation, and I'm not really a great guy for uh, PowerPoints. I always find that technology comes and usually bites me when I'm trying to use it, like right now. But anyway, the, the what we're trying to do is present kind of a longer view, and I have a couple of conclusions that I think are going to be self-evident if you haven't already come to them, in terms of what the tempo is and what the pace is of current domestic events in the United States. So let me end, let me begin with my ending. As much as we want to move on from the war on terrorism and from the asymmetric threat that's being provided. If you take a look at some of the things that are happening, particularly in places like Yemen, what you're seeing is, yes, the foreign threat certainly has been debilitated, degraded, and disrupted. And therefore, there's much more of a threat domestically with what I refer to as inspired but not instructed, self-radicalized, individual, who may not have any tradecraft, may have very limited training, but has the motivation to go out and try to provide some type of platform for attack. But these things come in cycles. And I've spent some time with our buddies at the agency and, and DHS, and they're all focused on the fact that though Al-Qaeda has certainly lost the, the head of the Hydra, other groups are sprouting up. We know that. The uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is forming its a very strong capability for overseas actions. We haven't seen them successfully complete one mission yet, but everybody anticipates that they will reach that capability sometime in the near future. So what does that mean for us? Well, I go through some of the different incidents that we've had, perhaps some of them you may not have remembered or known about, and then I discuss the difference, the, the, still the remaining obstacles, 11 years, as we take our domestic security and law enforcement infrastructure and try to morph it into a terrorism, a counterterrorism effort. And I've discussed the differences between the intelligence cycles and the prosecu prosecution cycles. Now let me, let me give you as to why, uh, why you might want to listen to me about this. I was chairman of the Homeland Security, the Homeland Security <coughs> Senate Committee in New York State. I served on Obama's transition team for uh, Homeland Security. I was on Cuomo's and I've got this really good 10,000 foot view of this stuff. But I've also got a chance to get involved on the police side. I'm overseeing the building, the rebuilding of the Nassau County Crime Lab. And so I've got a chance to sit with their lead development center and work through what they see on a daily basis. Because you know, at the end of the day, as much as we talk about terrorism from a national perspective, you, all, you and I all understand that it's the cop on the street, perhaps from a local police department, that's going to be an integral part of of finding and possibly stopping, as it has been an event. And yet, what they see is much different than what the pundits nationally see. So, as soon as we get this up, we are with one minute, maybe two. All right, so let me, let me kind of begin with, uh, with one of the key presentation moments. 
You're all familiar with Mumbai, the active shooting scenario. I was brought down to TSA and I was, uh, had received a classified briefing on that event immediately following it. And obviously you can't talk about that, but can talk about the overall reason why they brought me down there. Their question was very simple. Are we sure it can't happen here? The city of New York has probably, not probably, has the best, best equipped, best trained, greatest number of police officers in security in the world. I'm convinced of that. And people that work with the folks in NATO or the folks in the United Nations, everybody agrees with me. But even this police force in this city, if we had an attack like they did in Mumbai, would we really be able to effectively be able to stop it or react to it? We all know that the most dangerous aspect of any attack is a, an attacker who's willing to lose their lives, as they were in Mumbai. Once you get in sophisticated weaponry, weaponry, strategy, and tactics, you have a very, very potent attack metric. What we have to do, I think, is continue to do the hard thing, and that is prepare to make sure that we constantly reinvent ourselves and reinvigorate. I talk to a lot of police officers who sit there and say, you know, take a second, <coughs> for 10 years, you know, I, I get it, but I still have my day job. I've got to go after murderers and arsonists and rapists. You know, this, this whole issue about having to get involved in counterterrorism kind of metric, it's very, very different. And it's very, very difficult. Let me give you one uh, other example. I don't know if you're familiar with the Secure the Cities program. The design of the program was to provide concentric rings of radiological and nu nuclear detections for major urban areas. The first one being the city of New York. And it relied on two different forms of radiation and nuclear detection. Basically, rad eyes that were mobile uh, detection units and in stationary detection that would be brought in, to be into play at toll booths. Well, a part of this was to make sure that nothing gets into the island of Manhattan or into the city of New York. So obviously a lot of work was done with surrounding communities. And they brought in the local police officers, they trained them on the radiation equipment. Every year, Peter King, Congressman Peter King, great friend, great friend of the city, has provided $40 million of funding for this program year after year. They bought all this equipment. You go talk to folks up in Orange County, you go talk, talk to folks in the surrounding counties. You know where these rad eye pagers are right now? They're in a closet in the back of the police department. Do you know why? Because when they were driving around, they'd get hits and they'd have to pull somebody over with no other information than there was a radiation hit. That has constitutional issues. But moreover, it began to disrupt what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's a program that is really suffering from the longevity of the issue. It's so difficult to keep people's attention fixed on a mission when it's this long. So we're having really a fatigue. That's exactly the type of tempo the asymmetric warrior wants. That we truly live in our heart. And in this 24-hour news cycle, if you go back and you parse through what terrorists, terrorists want, they want visibility. They want to be able to take what they do and broadcast it across the globe. That's why the little attacks matter to them. They want visuals. They want to be able to show folks back in their areas, we are still a potent force, we can affect change, and we can do it very quickly and very cheaply. Remember the cargo bombing uh, plot that happened about, I think it was the fall of 2010, where they shrink-wrapped the, uh, uh, car the cartridges and they put them on planes? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that succeeded. That succeeded because it got them on the planes. And if it wasn't for the intelligence work in folks, you know, from folks in Yemen, where they actually shut down the operation, there could have been something really bad happening. But just because we stopped at that once, can we stop it every time? And that shows, obviously, the flaws in our systems. And it's, it's almost like cybersecurity as well. Every time we come up with a defense, every time we come up with a way to find out what the malware is in the system, the threat evolves. The attack scenario evolves. And it's exactly what's happening with what's going on currently in your domestic territory. Yep. Okay. So, defense. All right. So this is the 
uh, the primary question for today, is there still a threat? I think most people here would agree, yes, there is, but the question is, what's the nature of the threat? So let me just go take you a, a, a walk down memory lane. Shoe bomber. Uh, problem with this guy, he didn't fit any profiles. He didn't fit any profiles. And he succeeded. He got on a plane, and that was taken down. This was an accessible, a successful attack. Republican National Convention. These guys were below the radar screen. They began targeting the convention, and you know why they were picked up? Because of the great work by the NYPD. But they actually had to wait until the very last moment as they were planning to where to put the bombs in the subway system before they brought them down. <coughs> uh, look at bomb plot, you know, this, you know, this again was um, hours away, by some accounts, probably days away, from being successful. And what was so brilliant about this was, again, what was the terrorist trying to, to uh, what was Al-Qaeda trying to achieve? A visual, a worldwide visual that people would focus on and be, would be terrorized for. For this, these guys, um, obviously, they wanted to go after the military. And the five men here, they, the actually six men, they traveled to the Poconos and did training right among us. And the only reason why they picked them up, if you recall, was they took video of it. And they brought it to the local, I forget what store it was, I think it's uh, oh, the CBS. And the guy who's processing the film, he takes a look at what it is. And he sees guys running through the woods yelling, Allah Akbar, and you know, shooting weapons, uh, the paint, paint guns, and doing so in a way where it was a military training session. And then they found out what their target was, which was four days. Now this case you probably never heard of. So this is a personal uh, uh, effort. So I get appointed the Homeland Security Advisor in um, December 2006. In January and no, February 2007, I get a call from the Suffolk County PD. And District Attorney's office says, you got to get out of here. I've got something to show you. So they bring me out, and they say that in the middle of a very cold night, a Saturday night, in the end of January, at Calverton Airport, one of their security guards sees a guy testing a drone. Now, at the time, you can't, and you can't make this stuff up, the TV show 24 was actually talking about the use of a drone to attack a major city with a nuclear device. Well, this guy, he was, he was an Egyptian in origin, he was out on the, uh, the runway in the middle of the night testing a drone. Would you think anything else other than terrorism? I mean, seriously. You know, would you? And so what I was doing was the PD said, believe it or not, we can't get New York City FBI to take this case on. We just want to run this guy down. And they've got a lot of the leads they've got to follow. Joe Demers, the former uh, special agent in charge of the Counterterrorism Center here in New York, the FBI, once told me, that the hardest part about being involved in the counterterrorism game is not the threats you're trying to find, it's the threats you're trying to eliminate. The threat information. You get so many calls and you've got to chase down every single lead. So sometimes you just don't have the manpower to go out and do something like this. So we went out here and you know what it turned out? The guy was a scammer. He was trying to take this drone and sell it, as it to the defense department. <laughs> Kid you not. So it didn't go anywhere. The guy, they polyed him, he was fine. But again, you, you could have seen all our hair on fire once I saw these, this, uh, the clips and I saw the interviews from this guy. Uh, okay, JFK, you know, this was, um, again, from a personal perspective, I've been to a lot of press conferences. The intention, as a result of this case, when we did it on Saturday morning after we took the guys down, was the biggest media event I have ever been a part of. And what's the point of that? You attack JFK, the entire world pays attention. It's phenomenal visibility, which makes it a very robust target. Uh, this was a not fully baked plot. As it turned out, the, it probably would not have worked because of the way the piping system was done in the airport itself. But nonetheless, you had an insider's knowledge. The guy that actually worked at the airport. And he had the ability to, uh, where did he go? I don't know. Oh. Sir. Oh, we were doing so well, too. And so much good stuff with you. Um, anyway, so the, uh, the JFK bomb, bomb plot became... Sorry? 
<laughs> Remember I told you that uh, PowerPoint shoots and bite me in the, in the butt? Well, welcome to my world. Does he have to give a portrait to Mr. Sessions? No, it's just not in his face. Okay. Thank you. 